Good morning. Today is June 21, the year 2020. That's a good even number, I guess. And today is also Father's Day. And we want to congratulate all you fathers and tell you how much we appreciate every, each and every one. And just God bless you. One of the most blessed moments of my lives, life, so far has been when my children were born. And I thank God for them. They are a blessing from God. Today we're gonna be in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs was written by King Solomon. King Solomon by history tells us that he was one of the wisest men that ever existed. Uh, nobody is perfect except the Lord Jesus Christ. And I won't get into any why I don't think he was perfect because that's not my judgment to do. I'm not saying he wasn't. But anybody that had 700 wives and 300 concubines uh, had a short wire somewhere. But anyway, today we're going to talk about uh, Solomon. And he is talking to his son and he's telling him to follow God. And folks, that is the one and only singular most important move that a human being can make. We are created in God's image. There is an inherent need in our lives, a life of a human being, to have a relationship with God. There has been no civilization that we know of that didn't worship some supreme being. I didn't say God. I said supreme being or whatever, but every civilization has to honor that inherent God-given need to communicate with his or her creator. And thank God that he placed that in us and thank God for those of us that have accepted that gift of God and have that relationship with him. And it is our God-given task to share God with everybody, every created individual in this world, every man, woman, boy, girl. We are to share so that we will have, as this lesson says this morning, true joy. True joy is the outcome of the person who values and seeks God's wisdom. Everything that we do should be prefaced it should be a prerequisite before we make any major decision that we contact God and he will give us an answer. And then we need to listen because it might not be the answer we were expecting or wanted. And before we get into the lesson this morning, as we thank God for our, not only our earthly fathers, but for our heavenly father. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, as we come to thee this morning, we celebrate Father's Day. When Jesus taught us to pray, he said, our Father which art in heaven, you are our godly Father. You are our Father in heaven. You are our Creator. You are our only, one and only source of redemption and life after death. You have promised that we will live forever with you if we will do these things that you have told us to do, repent. We also thank you for our earthly fathers. We thank you for those that sacrificed to give us the things we had to prepare us for success in the world, to mentor us, to discipline us, to lead and guide, and most of all, love us. And I know that our heavenly father says, for God so loved the world, that's us, the world, that's his creation, human beings, that he gave his only begotten son, that had to be hard, Jesus Christ, to come into this world and die for the remission of our sins. And Father, we humble ourselves before you this morning. We humble ourselves before you and thank you is not enough. We just humble ourselves and pray to you our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our fathers, but most of all, we thank you for you and sending Jesus to pay our sin debt. And it is in the blessed name of that 
Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. The lesson comes from Proverbs 3. We're going to be reading 21, verse 21 through 35. And Solomon is dealing with something, and I do not, and I'll just tell you, you know, people say, I don't believe in this, and I don't believe in that. Well, I don't believe in coincidence. You know, I trust in God. I know that God is real. God has worked in my lives, and he is my life, and I am just nothing more, absolutely nothing more than a sinner saved by the grace of God. Jesus says, no man cometh to the Father unless he comes by me. Jesus is my ticket. I have professed my faith in him and I yield my life to him. And that is what I have absolutely nothing that I have, including that breath that I just inhaled and exhaled because God gave me the air. Jesus gave me the air and he gave me the power to ex exhale it. So we're here this morning in God's name. So again, I want you to understand that true wisdom, true wisdom is grounded in the person and the character of God. Man is born of a sinful nature. I want to stop here and let you and tell you this, that everything I say is not me. Don't listen to what I say, but what God says through me. I pray to God that I would not utter a word that would be dishonoring to him and that would lead you in any other direction except to God, not to any man. I don't care who he is, who he has been, what he does, whatever, just to God. And it says here that true wisdom, true wisdom is grounded in a person's relationship with God. It makes it a lot easier to follow a leader if they are grounded in God. So having said that, let's read in Proverbs 3, and we're gonna to skip to the 20, start with the 21st verse, and he says, and this is Solomon talking to his son. Now Solomon had a lot of kids having that many wives, I'm sure, but this one, and I think, and I'm just guessing at who it is, but Rehoboam, and he was his successor, and we'll probably get into that at a later time, but he says, maintain sound wisdom and discretion. As we just said, the only way to have sound wisdom is to trust in God, to communicate with God. And how do you communicate with God? Through prayer. We're gonna get into this in a few moments and it's probably gonna upset somebody and I can't help that, it's biblical. Uh, on the way the world is in turmoil today, there have been turmoils in the world before. It goes back to, you know, and we have a revolutionary war one time with England when we, uh, farmed our more perfect union, so to speak. And then there was a, this, you know, yesterday or one day this week, we are celebrated or remembered the Emancipa Emancipation Proclamation. It was on the June 19th and the end of slavery and all these things were wrong. All these things were wrong, but you cannot go back and pay and do all these things. You've just got to go forward and respect your fellow man. Going on. They will be life, these things right here. Don't lose sight of wisdom and discretion. They will be life for you and adornment for your neck. Then you will go safely on your way. Your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. You will lie down and your sleep will be pleasant. Don't fear sudden danger, son, or the ruin from the wicked when it, when, how, how's that? Not if, when it comes. For the Lord will be your competence and he will keep your foot from the snare. How in the world does that happen? In the Bible, a lot of people may not understand that that are not God or have not repented it, Bible says pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean you go around with your hands like this and utter mumbling prayers. That's not it. It is being in such a relationship with God that he is right there with you all the time. You don't have to be in verbal communication. He is in your body. That's what he's wanting to be right there at all the time. It says he will keep your foot from the snare. 
If you are in God's will, he will lead and guide you. Does that mean bad things won't happen? No, it doesn't. But it means that God will be there with you when it does. And all these things will come about in a better way. Going on, it says, keep your eyes fastened on God's wisdom. Folks, we do not spend, my opinion now, we do not spend enough time in isolated, and that's a term that we've had here, quarantine or whatever, and I don't, you know, we don't like quarantine. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, he says, when you pray, go into your closet. What does he mean? You don't have to go into your closet to pray. It means when you talk to God on a daily basis or however often you talk to him, many times daily, you need to be on a one-on-one, one-on-one -on -one conversation, no distractions. You need to keep your eyes on Jesus. There's a song, you know, keep your eyes on Jesus. Going on. True wisdom, this is the writer of this lesson, say, will build a wall around you. Well, walls have a tendency to come down. People, when things, human beings, when things are good, things are going their way, have a tendency to puff up with pride. Look what I have done. And then when things are bad, they have a tendency, their walls come down and they want to know what happened to God. Well, you walked away from him. That's what happened. You've quit giving him credit. And God says, I am a jealous God. And that doesn't mean he's just jealous of, he, of you and you're, uh, that he wants to keep you near him. That's important too. But he's also saying, where do you think all these blessings that you enjoy come from? Where do you think your health comes from? Where do you think your success in your whatever chosen field comes from? Whatever happens, God says, I want you to give me the glory I deserve. And that's very important. If you don't think so, when you get to heaven, ask Moses. He told Moses to speak to the rock. Moses was frustrated with the people. He ran it back and hit it. Water did come, but God says, come on, buddy, let's go up on the mountain. I'm going to show you the promised land, but you got the glory for hitting the rock. And since you did that, I'm going to show you the promised land, and you are a child of mine, and you're going to be with me forever, but you're not going in the promised land. God disciplines, chastises, chastens, I think the Bible says, those whom he loves, and he loves us. Going on. God is with us, and it is his presence in our lives that produce confidence. It is our presence, the presence of God in our lives. We will reflect that. There are salesmen, there are con men, there are scam artists, there are everything in the world out here today. And the only way to be confident in your relationship is with those people is to be comfortable with your relationship with God. You need to be compassionate, but you also don't need to be blind. And God says, I am your spiritual eyes. I can tell you, I can give you that inner feeling. And if you get that inner feeling that something's wrong, stop. Go talk to God about it. He'll either take the, thing, the feeling away or he will explode it in your life so that you'll know that this is not what I want you to do. Beware. Going on. When it is in your power, he was talking to his son, and that is also talking to us. When it is in your power, don't withhold good from the one to whom it belongs. He was addressing employers. Excuse me. He was addressing employers. And this was people that didn't pay on time, that had people working for them, that were depending on them. And when someone finishes a job for you, that is no longer your money, it is theirs because they completed the job. I hate to use personal experiences, I use too many, but I grew up in a household, my, it was just my brother, I have one sibling and my daddy, and we were a hunting family. We hunted all over well, lots of places, but my daddy, emphasized to us, we were grown men. And he said, young man, don't come and get in this truck and let's leave if you owe anybody. Now we're not talking about long-term notes at the bank or whatever, but if you owed a feed a bill at the feed store, if you owed whatever you owed, if you had a credit there that was on a monthly basis, 
He said, don't you leave town on a vacation or a pleasure trip owing any one because it could be possible that they'd like to go too, but you have their money in your pocket and you're spending it on yourself when it is actually theirs. That may be a bad analogy, but it's stuck. If someone does something for you, when they complete that, that is their money. And that's what God, uh, he was telling his son here. When it is in your power, don't withhold good or money from anyone when it belongs to them. Don't say to your neighbor, go away, come back later. I'm busy, I'll give it to you tomorrow. When it is there with you all the time. Don't plan any harm against your neighbor for he trusts you, I hope he does, and he lives near you. Don't accuse anyone without cause when he has done nothing to harm you. We are in the midst of politics, of political races. And folks, it is just getting depressing. It is depressing to see what we are experiencing and listening to what we listen to and see how it is distorted, how words are taken out of context. And I'm not talking about presidential races, I'm talking about local races, I'm talking about state races, and I'm talking about national races. This is something that, you know, when you listen to the opponent, you'd say, well, that person needs to be in jail somewhere. And then we are experiencing, a, it has happened before, but we are experiencing an unrest in our, in our country today that we haven't experienced in a great while. Uh, what's going to happen? I don't know, but I do know the source of the, or I do know the solution, and that is God. People say, well, it's the family. Amen, it is the family, but a family cannot be what it needs to be without God being the head of the family. That's just the way it is. And that's what Solomon is telling his son here today. If you're going to be successful, you've got to put God G-O-D, capital letters, God, first in your marriage, first in your work, first in your neighbor relationships, first in your private and personal life. Everything you do, you cannot be compassionate to your fellow man if you do not have God in your life because all these things, and people will say, well, he's got an ulterior motive, ulterior motive, either one you want to use because that is true. And that's what he's talking about here about the wicked people. There are people out there, there are scam artists, and there are people that would just out and out lie for absolutely no reason going on. The wise believer will not, now listen, the wise believer will not participate in slander or community gossip. There's three little monkeys and I don't know they've got names, see no, hear no, speak no, or whatever their name is, but that's a good adage to have, talking about evil. Don't see it, don't speak it, don't hear it. If someone is telling you something that is not your business, it is slanderous to someone that you don't know, stop. I don't want to hear it. It is not gratifying. It's not what I need to hear. I am compassionate. Don't run someone else down. And I go back to the politicians. They don't tell you what they're going to do. They just tell you what their opponent did wrong. Folks, I, we've all done enough wrong. Tell us what you, through God's wisdom, are going to do to improve our world and giving stuff away is not improving the world. We need to help our fellow man. Going on, nothing is more rewarding, this, this is coming from God, nothing is more rewarding than being faithful to God. What profit a man if he gains the whole world, we're talking about material things, and loses his soul? because when he goes to hell, he's carrying nothing with him. None of the comforts that he enjoyed on earth. The only thing, you know, I hear people say all the time at funeral service, and you know, he came into this world with nothing and he left with nothing, wrong, wrong. Man came into the world born of a sinful nature. He came into this world lost. 
he can leave this world lost. And then that preacher was right or whomever did the service, he left with nothing. But those of us, and I pray it is everyone in the sound of this voice that God is providing today, every one of us that leaves this world knowing God as our Savior left with something, and that is eternal life with Jesus Christ. That is something you can't buy, you can't earn, you can't work it up, you can't work that debt off. All you can do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So once you've done that, then you are obligated to serve your fellow man with compassion, with understanding, with help, should they need it, not expecting return. Okay, there's a Wall Street, and I'm not an investor in that stuff, but they tell us that, and I, some people are, and good for you. I'd rather see it in the form of a cow I'd put my hand on her. But anyway, there are people that tell us that they made this, they made that. I succeeded here, I succeeded there. Everything we have is God's, everything. And once we leave this world, we can, we're going to take God with us or we're not gonna take God with us. And that's the only choice, yes or no, going on. The point of this lesson, being compassionate as a child of God, the point of this lesson is to be faithful to God, not what we're going to get in return. God blesses those whom he loves. And we're gonna get into those things here in a minute. It says, and we need to understand this, that God is the source of all blessings, whether it be worldly, material, spiritual, all we have, everything. And I breathed when we started this lesson, I took in air, I expelled carbon dioxide. Everything we have, and I know you think, well, that's just elementary. If you think it's elementary, have you ever had your, the breath, the air knocked out of your lungs for temporarily? There's a pain, there is a panic, panic situation. You're desperate for air and you get it. But that's a gift of God, that very inhaling of oxygen, the very expelling of carbon dioxide. That is a normal function. That is a normal bodily function that's called, that anyway, it is not, it doesn't have to be controlled. It's involuntary. You're doing that anyway, but that's a gift of God. Everything we have, including that, all your possessions, the car you drive, the clothes you wear, the shoes you wear, the children you have, the relationship you have with your fellow man. I hope you have good Christian relationships. All of that, every bit of that is a gift of God. And God wants to bless you. He said, I want you to have life and I want you to have it abundantly. How many times now when something goes wrong and you see someone that expresses absolutely no belief in God, their vocabulary, their actions, their relationships with their fellow man reflect that they don't know God. And when something goes wrong, he says, oh, I'm praying. Okay, I wanna read this right here. God turns a deaf ear to those who are unwilling to give him the glory for all things in their life. That is biblical, that is here. If we refuse to recognize God and repent to him and recognize him and profess him before our fellow man, those are our neighbors, those are our family, those are our children, those are our wives or husbands, however the, the situation will be there. This is something that we need to understand that for God to answer our prayers, we need to have a personal relationship with him. Well, you kind of, well, I don't know. Okay, here is your, you're in a public place somewhere at a meeting or whatever, and your child comes up and in my situation, daddy, would you give me a dollar? I need this. You, you don't hesitate if you've got it. Okay, a stranger that you've never known. You look over there and he has just slapped this little kid trying to take the, another dollar from somebody else. 
He is looking around. He's trying to steal something. He walks up to you and says, hey, man, I need a dollar. Do you reach and get it? My example is here is a person that absolutely refuses to recognize God as and give him the glory, give him the credit for who God is. And then when he gets in trouble, he needs the dollar, he needs whatever. He said, oh, I'm praying. And what does God say? God turns a deaf ear to them. They find themselves living out, this is important, his, H-I-S, capitalized, his curse on them because of their selfish lifestyles. Selfish lifestyles. God addresses that. He says, pride will definitely result in the sinner's fall. All of us know someone probably that is very successful worldly, materially, and they say, I have done well. Okay, I go back to that verse. What profit you if you did well and when you die, your soul goes to hell. There's no profit in that. Life on earth is short. God himself, he said, it is like a vapor. Vapor is just like the fog in the morning. It's there when you get up and then in a few hours, by 10 o'clock or so, it's gone. You can't find it. Well, that's life. That's the way it goes. God says right here, God will hold up a righteous man. All of us will be judged. We are not to judge people. That's part of this lesson here today. We are not to judge people. We can call attention, but we have, do not have the power to judge them. Only God does. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. We don't need to do this. All of us, one of these days, whether we're called before we die an earthly death and meet him in the air, or we've been dead a thousand years, and when they were called first before the live on earth, we're called to meet him in the air. That's called the rapture. All of us, one of these days, and all that, how all that, how that works out in the timetable and so forth, I'm not interested in that because it's beyond my control, way above my pay grade. Only God knows. Jesus said himself, I don't know when all the end of this is going to happen. Only my Father in heaven does. But when it does happen, every one of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And he's going to say one or two things. Well done, enter into your reward, or depart from me, you worker of iniquity. And this is right here, I'm going to explain that, because I never knew you. He never knew you as his repentant child who professed Jesus Christ in your life before man while you breathe God's air walking on God's earth dealing with God's other created peoples that's us going on nothing compares to being on friendly terms with God isn't it nice to have earthly friends that you really believe in and trust in human relations, that if you're in physical trouble, that you're in need, you don't have a doubt that they would move whatever they could and try their earthly physical best to help you. Folks, that is comforting in itself. But as good as that friend is, he can't save you from your sins. He cannot save you and give you eternal life. Only Jesus Christ can. So isn't it good for us that know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior to know that we have a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I only have one, and I pray for him every day, and I am confident he prays for me every day. But sticketh closer than a brother, and that is our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. What I'm saying there is that a lot of Christians do not pray enough, and don't misinterpret what I'm gonna say, and a lot of non-Christians pray too much. 
because they're praying to someone they don't have not professed their belief in. They're praying to someone that they do, they do not give credit for what they have or what's going on. They only curse God when things are bad and they don't need God when things are good. Going on. God gives grace to the humble. To the humble. That's what we said a few moments ago. Pride goeth before the fall. We are in a prideful, look what I have done, look what I have accomplished. I is a bad word. I remember this was not original with my high school football coach, but anyway, he just told us, and this was not original, but it made an impression on me and I haven't forgotten it. He says, boys, there is no I in team. We are a group. Every one of you, someone, somewhere, some lady calls you her son. Somewhere, someone, some man called you his son. And there's no I in team. Today, we are part of a group. None of you, none of you are indispensable for this team. We need you, but we only need you if you are a team player, not a I. Did you see what I did? We won, not I won. Going on, the Lord should be the head of your household. The Lord should be your leader, your wisdom giver in relationships with your fellow man. This lesson today brings this out here. It said, bad neighbors betray their neighbors. Bad neighbors say bad things about their neighbors. Bad neighbors try to entice their neighbors to do wrong. Bad neighbors are inconsiderate of their neighbors. Bad neighbors lie to and about their neighbors. Bad neighbors are loud and obnoxious to their neighbors. I'm sure that all those things that are read, some of you pictured someone. Hopefully, they didn't picture you in these things. We need to be good neighbors. Sometimes that's difficult. Sometimes it is very difficult to be a good neighbor, to have compassion, but we should recognize that all have sinned, including us. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the only difference, we're all sinners. Some of us are saved by God's grace and some have chosen not to accept that gift of salvation that Jesus died for. All of us are God's creation. All of us are people that he came into this world and died for, all of us. But it is up to us. He gave us freedom of choice. My prayer for everyone, my prayer for everyone in this world, I don't care what color he is, she is, what nationality, whatever. We have so many things going on in our world today but God created man. He didn't say he created this color, that color, whatever color, any of all this stuff. God created man. God created woman. He said, go and multiply and inhabit the earth and groom it, take care of it, and be husbandry man, and that means take care of it as the best we can. And God will bless us for that. But we are his children, and we're going to be judged by our Heavenly Father. Today, let's have compassion. Be slow to judge. I like that adage. It was probably an Indian proverb. I think that's what they give it credit for. Don't judge me until you've walked a mile in my moccasins. You don't know what is going on in a person's life. And that's when I said, don't judge. Be compassionate. There may be people that are so ingrained in sin. There may be some people whose heart are so hard that you can't, literally, you can't reach them, but you can pray for them because God can reach them, but he will not or cannot unless we are willing to share with him, with them, our Savior. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless this Father's Day and to bless every family there. There are families hurting. We had a funeral this week in town of a wonderful young man and the services that, that, they had, that his family provided for him were very honoring. 
And I just do not, I cannot fathom the pain of losing a child. And some very good friends here lost their only son survival, surviving son this week, 50 years old, way too soon. The world needs more men like this young man was. And let's remember that family. There are others that have lost in recent weeks, lost loved ones, husbands, lost other children, daughter, other things have happened. I can't tell you why, but I can just tell you that God is the great comforter. God is the great healer. He is the great physician. And let's go to him today, thanking him not only for him being our heavenly father, but thank him for our earthly fathers. Dear Lord, we come to thee today. We started this lesson with our Father which art in heaven, and we're going to end with that same prayer, our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Glorified be your name. We humble ourselves before you now, asking you to intervene in the situation in these United States and in this world that we are dealing with. Father, only you, only God, there is not one political leader ever before or ever will be that can change this except you. We pray for you to lead families. Make that father the head of a Christian family. Make that wife the helpmate, the co-worker, the co-leader that she is supposed to be in a Christian family. We ask that peace and harmony will reign that children will grow up knowing that my dad, my mom loved God and they instilled that upon us and that will make a difference in the world. And it is in the blessed, blessed name of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Savior, we pray, amen. Thank you all for listening.